Hello, this is Mr. Coates, and this is Apes Lecture number 50 on water resources. The goal of this lecture is to talk about where we get our fresh water, what are the water resources on the planet, and what do we do with that fresh water. So the first thing I want to do is talk about what is water. Well, water is H2O, and we all know that. So this is what the molecule looks like. We have oxygen up here, and then we have two hydrogens down here. And one of the things we have to realize is that these hydrogens are covalently bonded to the oxygen. This means that they share an electron pair. So here's one of those pairs right here. And the other one is right here. And because they share these pairs, what happens is that oxygen really likes its electrons. It really doesn't want to share. And so it keeps the rest of its outer shell electrons, which are these ones in this area up here, keeps those outer shell electrons away from these hydrogens. They don't like to give, they don't like to get them close to those hydrogens. And so the electrons are unevenly shared in the molecule. And so what this does, if you remember, electrons are negatively charged. And so if we put all the electrons pretty much on one side of the molecule, what this does, it gives this a net negative charge up here. Down here where the hydrogens are, since most of the negative charge is taken up by the oxygen, the hydrogens actually have a plus charge down here, and both of them have a plus charge. This gives the molecule a positive and negative N, and we call this polar. If you're a polar molecule, that means you have absolutely charged ends. And this gives water a whole bunch of its important properties. For one thing, if we have two water molecules, that means when they get close together, this, neg this positive is attracted to the negative end of another water molecule. This is a hydrogen bond, and it's a very weak bond, but it's an important bond when it comes to water. And this hydrogen bond actually gives some of its properties. One of those properties is cohesion. Water likes to stick to itself. If you've ever taken a penny and taken a water dropper and dropped water on top of that penny, after a while you'll get a dome of water on top of that penny without it falling off. And this is because water would rather stick to itself than fall off of that penny. And this is cohesion. Water is also very good at sticking to other things. If you remember when you were little and you washed your hands at a sink that was taller than you, the water would run down your arms and get your sleeves all wet. Well, this is adhesion because water sticks to other things like your arms. These properties make water very valuable for life. It allows plants to take water up into their leaves, uh, especially very tall trees like 400 foot tall redwood trees. It also allows water to carry minerals and dissolve things. And this is why water is called the universal solvent. It also gives water that special property where its solid floats on top of its liquid. No other material on the face of the planet has this property. And this is because when water freezes, this hydrogen bonding here actually changes. And what happens to this hydrogen bonding is that uh, when ice forms, the hydrogen bonds actually get longer and the molecules rearrange themselves. And this makes ice less dense than its liquid form because the molecules are actually pushed further apart. So you can have the same mass of water when it's a liquid and a solid, but the volume actually changes. The volume increases when it's ice, and when that happens and the mass stays the same, that means density also decreases. And that's a very important property because that allows water to freeze from the top down, and this allows a lot of life to live under frozen water. So water is a very special molecule for life. In fact, you can't live more than three days without water. You can live a couple weeks without food, but without water, you'll die pretty quick. Very important, our bodies are mostly made out of water. So what about the planet? The planet is about 75% uh, of water. However, 71% of that is ocean, that is salt water, and that's typically water that we can't really use. Now there's also a good portion that is locked up in glaciers and ice. And also we consider that not to be very usable either. Uh, we can melt it, but it takes a lot of energy to melt that. So the rest of our water that we have available here is our usable fresh water, and that only accounts for uh, two hundredths of a percent, or a little bit over two hundredths of a percent of all the water on the planet. Now that's not a whole lot of water. Now that water's locked up in lakes, it's locked up in streams, it's locked up in rivers, uh, it's some of the precipitation, and it's also in the ground, in groundwater called aquifers. 
and this water is the water that we need in order to survive. Now the main uses that we use for water is agriculture. Agriculture is the biggest use of water on the planet. And what we see here is a center pivot irrigation system and this irrigation system has these wheels and it travels around the field and sprays water at the crop level. And we use 70% of that fresh water on the planet for agriculture. 20% then is used in industry for cooling power plants and other factories. It's also used in, uh, as a solvent for a lot of different industrial processes. Thankfully, a lot of this water can be reused and can be recycled. The remaining 10% then is used for household and urban use. That goes for our drinking water, our sewage, and our cleaning. And in fact, most of that water is used at disposal of our sewage. Now, naturally, the water gets recycled, and this is the water cycle. We remember back in the first part of class, we talked about the biogeochemical cycles, and the water cycle is one of those most important cycles. And I'm just going to show you this slide. I'm not going to go over this because this is just repeat, but you need to refresh yourself on the water cycle. Now, the important thing about the water cycle is that it's responsible for cleaning and recycling all of that fresh water. Without the water cycle, we would not have as much clean fresh water as we do. Once again, you need to know these processes, precipitation, evaporation, condensation, transpiration, percolation, and infiltration. Make sure you know those processes. Make sure you know uh, what they do and why they're important. If you need uh, more info on that, go back to the original lecture on biogeochemical cycles. Now, an area of land that drains to a water body is called its watershed. Now, why is the watershed important? importance is, is that everything that happens within that watershed has the ability to affect the water body. When it rains, any pollutants or any nutrients that might be in that watershed run off into the nearest water body. Now, if we're talking about excess nitrogen and phosphorus, which is very common here in Florida, then we get what we call cultural eutrophication. We've talked about this before. A lot of nutrients in a water body can cause algae blooms and eventually lead to fish kills. Also, any pollutants on the ground, oils from cars, any kind of uh, acids, any kind of other pollutants that might be dropped, trash, for example, can make its way into the nearest water body because it's in the watershed. Now, we live in Tampa Bay here, and uh, this is the Tampa Bay watershed. The bay is in this area here, and the watershed is almost four times bigger than the bay itself. Go to school right about here. All of the water that we uh, put on the ground or that falls on the ground and anything that gets washed away will eventually make its way into the Alifier River which flows down this way and into Tampa Bay. And so we are within the Tampa Bay watershed as well as all of downtown Tampa, all of St. Petersburg, uh, some of Sarasota and Bradenton down here and almost all, goes all the way over to uh, Lakeland. So we have a very large watershed and all of this area of land and anything in it has a potential to affect Tampa Bay. And so this is why the watershed is very important. If the water body's dirty, chances are it's coming from the watershed. Now one of the other things we have to talk about when we talk about water resources is water shortages. Water shortages happen in several different areas for different reasons. For one, you could be a dry climate where you uh, naturally have low rainfall, like in desert areas. You could have drought conditions where you have low rainfall than normal and high evaporation. Uh, that is occurring with this picture here. You have two little girls that are walking, trying to find water, and they're walking on a dry riverbed. And this is what we're also seeing in California right now. It's 2015, and California just went through its worst drought year ever in 2014. And it was mostly because they didn't get a whole lot of rainfall, and they have high evaporation rates there in California and they're still dealing with the drought even though they had a fairly wet winter. You could also have desiccation when deforest or you trample the earth and you get rid of the vegetation. This will automatically dry out the soil. And water stress, which is overuse of the water supply. If you pump too much out of the aquifer or you take too much of a reservoir or you pipe the water where it's not sustainably done. If we look at this map down here, it shows us the United States and the water issues associated with the country as a whole. And if we outline this area, this is the area that has the largest amount of water scarcity. And obviously this is the desert southwest. There are also some other areas in here of shortages, and that's most of the United States, and especially those areas around urban, large urban areas. All this blue is large urban centers, and there tends to be quite a lot of water shortages in those areas. 
However, when we get out of those, then we get it to adequate. But only a little bit of the eastern or southeastern United States had an adequate water supply. And unfortunately, most of the country is overusing our water. Well, I hope you learned something about where our water comes from in the United States and what we do with it. And make sure if you have any questions, please bring them to class and we'll discuss them.